Ancestral Arrowheads. Is this flower a buttercup too? Caitlin wondered aloud as she waded into the pond and picked a flower growing in the water. Looking closer, she could see that the flower had lots of stamens and a cone-like center much like buttercups, but without hook tips on the individual pistils. In addition, the flower had three white petals. No, I don't think it's a buttercup, she answered her own question, but I wonder if it might be some kind of monocot. Tee hee, Shinleya chuckled. It is indeed a monocot. Did you notice the arrowhead shaped leaves? It is an arrowhead plant from the arrowhead or water plantain family. Arrowheads are monocots, while buttercups are dicots. But yes, the flowers look similar. It looks a lot like the fossil you showed us, Grandma, Peter exclaimed. That's right, Shanley added. Arrowheads and buttercups have both retained many ancestral characteristics and look vaguely similar, even though one is a monocot family and the other a dicot family. Peter waded out and picked another aquatic plant with three-petaled flowers. Is this plant in the arrowhead family too, he asked. It looks similar to Caitlin's flower, but it doesn't have as many stamens or pistils. Good observation, Shinleya said. Yes, they are in the same family. The arrowheads are aquatic plants with three green sepals, three white petals, plus three, six, or numerous stamens. The most distinguishing feature is this cone-like cluster of six or more simple pistils. Your flower is called water plantain. Joining the fun, Adelia waded out into the swamp and found another white three-petal flower with a cone-like center, which Shinleya called burrhead. They compared the similarities and differences between each flower. I want to learn more about this arrowhead, Caitlin insisted. Can we eat it? Sure, Shinleya said. Worldwide, there are about 90 different species in their arrowhead family, and many species have starchy, edible roots. But first, do you have to do a little dance? Wade out into the arrowhead patch and dance around the plants. Peter, Adelia, and Caitlin giggled and played along with the strange request until the water turned chocolate brown from all the mud the kids turned up with their feet. Then a funny thing happened. Little potato-like tubers started floating to the surface. The longer they danced, the more tubers floated up until there were more than enough for everyone. The children, Shanley said, giving them her collecting bag, gather the tubers and let's save them for lunch. Misogynous mallows. Shanley walked with her great, great, great grandchildren through the meadows, tickled to see them run and play. Caitlin picked hibiscus flowers, strung them together on a grass stem, tied a knot, and hung them around Peter's neck, then ran away giggling. Peter laughed too. Then he noticed something unusual and turned to Shanleya. This flower has five sepals, five petals, and a whole bunch of stamens, he said. But the stamens are all stuck together around a five-point star in the middle. Yes, Peter. More advanced flowers are more specialized, with reduced numbers of flower parts, and the parts are often fused together. Mallows have numerous stamens, but the stamens are fused together as a column in the middle of the flower. That is a good pattern for recognizing the mallows. But what about this thing in the middle? Is that a pistol? Adelia speculated. That's right, Shinleya said. You're looking at the tip of the pistol, called the stigma, which catches the pollen. The pollen reaches down through the tube-like style to fertilize egg cells within the ovary at the base of the pistol. The egg cells then develop into seeds. Why does it look like a star? Peter wondered. Shinleya continued. As pistols fuse together to form a compound pistol, they may fuse together only at the base, as is common in many roses. Let me fuse all the way up to the styles so that only the stigmas are separate, such as in this hibiscus. I get it, Caitlin said. There were five pistols squished together to make a single pistol with a five-pointed stigma. This pistol must have five carpels. Those are... Shinleya started to speak. Hey! The petals are slimy, Peter interrupted, squishing them with his fingers. Shinleya smiled. The mallows are highly mucilaginous. A tea of the leaves is soothing for a sore throat. Or mash the leaves and add a little water to treat a sunburn, much like the unrelated aloe vera. But can we eat them? Adelia wondered. Sure, Shanley replied, picking the malva neglecta leaves at Adelia's feet. 
There are about 1,500 species in the traditional Marlowe family, and only cotton is known to be poisonous. Little black dots in the plant contain a toxin that helps protect it from grazing. Shalaya handed a malo leaf to each child to taste. These leaves are good in salad, she said, and you can make a special treat from the fruits. Beat them into a foamy froth, add egg whites and powdered sugar, then put large dough, set in cookie sheet, and lightly bake them in the oven. Sounds delicious, Peter said. Well, what are they? Marshmallows, Shalaya said with a smile as she turned away and continued walking. Evening Primrose Shalaya and the children walked into a burned forest. A fire must have swept through in recent years. The trees were charred black skeletons. The ground is mostly barren, but there are great patches of tall herbs with bright pinkish-purple flowers. What beautiful flowers, Caitlin exclaimed. They are bringing life back to the dead land, Peter added. That's called fireweed, Shinlea said. It is a colonizer plant, one of the first to grow in burned areas. Look, Adelia said, it has a four-parted stigma for four carpels. That means that four pistols must have fused together as one. That's right, Adelia, Shinlea said, and that four-parted stigma is a great pattern for recognizing the evening primrose family. So it's four sepals, four petals, eight stamens, and a pistil with a four-parted stigma, Caitlin said. All the parts are in fours. This is the first flower we have looked at today that doesn't have numerous stamens, Peter observed. Very good, Peter, Shenley said. You are really learning your plants. Are evening primrose edible? Adelia asked. There are about 650 species in the evening primrose family, and none of them are poisonous, Shenley said. But most of them are not really food either. Young fireweed shoots can be simmered in water to make a nice potter. Also, the dead stalks of fireweed and tall evening primrose have long fibers that can be twisted into strong cordage. Why is it called the evening primrose family, Grandmother? Caitlin asked. There's an unrelated family of plants called the primroses, Shinlea said as they passed back into another meadow. But we probably won't find them around here. Evening primroses are special because of this, Shinlei said, pointing to a beautiful, large, white blossom growing almost on the ground. Evening primroses are pollinated by nighttime moths. Lay on the grass in the evening just as it's getting dark. You may be able to watch a bud open and bloom. Be very still and you might see a moth come by to pollinate it. The flower petals often wilt away the following day. Cool, Peter said. I want to stay up late to watch an evening primrose bloom. Shinlea gathered the dead stalks of a tall evening primrose and then continued along her way, with the kids eagerly following along. Grass Ropes Shinlea and the kids found a rock fire pit in a meadow and stopped to make their lunch. While the children gathered firewood, Shinlea carved a fireboard and drill from the roots of a fallen tree. Then she stripped the fibrous bark off the evening primrose stalks and spun them into cordage, using it as a string on a bow. She finished her bow and drill set with a hand socket made from a thick piece of bark. Caitlin, Peter, and Adelia checked on Shanley's progress between loads as they gathered firewood of all sizes, dry grass and twigs to start the fire, bigger sticks to build the fire up, and a few fat sticks as fuel to keep the fire going. Will you teach me to make cordage? Caitlin asked. Sure thing, Shinlei replied, after we get our fire going. She put her bow and drill set to work, using the bow to spin the drill until friction with the fireboard generated a hot mass of black powder that soon began to glow red. Shinlei transferred the hot coal into a nest-like ball of dry grass and blew it into flame. The kids added twigs to the fire and then larger sticks, making it bigger and bigger. Okay, kids, can you go out into the meadow and bring back a big pile of the tallest green grasses you can find? Sure, Grandmother. What for? Peter asked. You'll see, Shenlea said. She gave them each a pair of gloves to protect them from brass cuts and tended the fire while the children gathered grass. Shenlea nestled the arrowhead tubers into the hot coals to bake, careful to keep them away from the flames. Just then, the children returned, half hidden behind their great armloads of grass. Great, Shenlea said. Now lay the grass out on the ground in two long parallel rows. Okay, let's stand two lines outside the grass facing each other. We'll need about six of us on each side, she said. 
But there's only four of us, Caitlin countered, confused. Maybe the guardians will help us, Shen Lei replied. Hey, guardians, are you out there? We need your help. Leaves rustled around the edge of the meadow, and the guardians emerged, blinked in the light, and came forward to help. The kids figured out who was who among the buttercup, arrowhead, mallow, and eating primrose guardians, but didn't recognize the others. Kids and guardians lined up along both sides of the grass. Shinlei instructed them to reach down and pick up the grass, doing their best to hold it together as two long lines. Shinlei bent a separate handful of grass in half. Then she brought the two lines together at one end and connected them into her piece and instructed, Okay, everyone, start rolling your grass in the same direction and the two lines will twist together. Kids and guardians started rolling the grass, and the end started twisting over, making the two strands into one. Hey, this is what you did to make the cordage, Caitlin said, only bigger. We're making a rope, Peter exclaimed. Shalaya worked along both lines, adding grasses needed to keep the rope even as it twisted together. What started out as individual blades of grass quickly merged and fused together to make something bigger, longer, and stronger. Much as flower parts merge together and gradually evolve to create whole new species, the two lines of grass magically evolved before their eyes Can from one thing into another. As the twisting moved past East Kid or Guardian, Shinlei sent them to the end of the rope to hold it up and help it twist together. In no time at all, they had a nice long grass rope. Shinlei had tied a knot at the end to keep it from coming undone. How strong is it? Peter wondered. That depends on how well we made it, Shanley said. If the strands are even and twisted equally around each other, then the rope can be very strong. But if one side is bigger and wraps around the other, then the rope can break quite easily. Let's test it, Caitlin said eagerly. Kids and guardians formed mixed teams or tug of war, laughing and screaming, moving forward and then back, giggling, playing, and falling over. They formed new teams, tugged and tugged again, until everyone was exhausted and hungry. All that was left of the fire was a few hot coals. Shalaya dug the tubers from the ashes and let the cool on a rock. She and the children and the guardians listened to the birds, watched the butterflies around them, and ate their wild snack. There were just enough tubers for everyone to enjoy. When lunch was over, Shalaya and the kids thanked the guardians for coming out to play and waved goodbye as they disappeared into the bushes. Shalaya poured water on the fire until it was out cold, and they continued their walk.